So, Geraint, we're back. Uh, we're still in lockdown, unfortunately, but there's more mysteries to be looked at in the universe. This is the other dark problem in our universe, dark energy. What is dark energy? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, look, we spoke about dark matter, and as I mentioned, Nobel Prize winning territory if you work out what dark matter is. Yeah. Dark energy is a bigger problem. It's a much bigger <laughs> problem for a lot of reasons. So, um, look, let's let's try and do the historical context again. Right. Um, so, it, it starts with Einstein. Mm -hmm. Lots of things start with Einstein. Yep. And all the good things. All the good things. Einstein and his uh, cosmological models. You know, he was he he took the equations of relativity. He wanted to write down an equation to describe the entire universe, and you know the the, the the Hollywood version is he looked at his equations. His equations said that the universe should be expanding or contracting. He had in his mind, same as many other people, that the universe was static, eternal, and changing. Mm -hmm. So he needed to somehow work into his equations something to counter the evolution. Yeah. And I, I find this badly described in a lot of popular science books that he fudged the equations. That's, that's not what he did. He saw that there was a space where there was a zero that you could make the term in there non-zero acted like an anti-gravity gives you repulsion. Uh, and so you now have a universe which is static and stable. The universe would, would, would go out of order very, very quickly, but static. And of course, this was in the 1920s. And by the end of the 1920s, you had the observations of Hubble uh, showing that there was universal expansion and uh, according to Gamow, you know, uh, Einstein threw out this cosmological constant term, as he called it, yeah. that it was his, um, his biggest blunder. Yeah. So cosmological constant hid there in the background, bubbling along. Theorists <laughs> thought about it, but that's about it. Until we get uh, to... There's an interesting little uh, tidbit here. I think this is in um, Barrow and Tipler's book, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle. It's just a sideline. You could you could almost you can sort of get a cosmological constant out of Newton's theory, if you start. So whenever an equation turns up in physics, at some point someone just has to go, "Hey, what if it's this?" And then an equation comes out. So there's a couple of different ways to get to any given equation. One of the ways you could think about Newton's equation. I'm trying to make sure I get this right, and I will cut this section out if I get it wrong. But if you say it's a feature of Newton's equation that if you have a sphere of stuff and then you think what what uh, gravitational pull is that having on this thing which is outside the sphere? And what for Newton's theory, the very nice result is it's the same as if it, if all of that stuff was collapsed down to the center. And so you can think of a sphere of stuff in terms like a planet as just being a point with matter, and then it just pulls on that, that other point that you had. If you started off by saying, what sort of uh, gravity equation has that property, that a sphere is the same as a point, you get Newton's um, law of gravity, plus another term, which is the same as the cosmological constant. You get basically a repulsive term that increases with distance. Uh, like the radius, whereas the, the Newton term goes like one over the radius squared. And so with the benefit of hindsight, the, you, there's, there's always these options sort of behind the scenes in these theories. And so that's one of the things Einstein found was there's, this, there's a way behind the scenes of putting this thing in. There, there's a nice discussion of that very topic, the Newtonian cosmological constant by Calder and Lahar, which uh -huh. we, we will link. I will, I will link somewhere. Yeah. Which which shows that if you if you solve Poisson's equation, you for a, a point mass, you end up with this uh, repulsive term. Ah yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. So okay. So but but when we get to the end of the nineteen nineties, of course, what we have uh, observations of cosmological supernova exploding yep. stars at large distance, um, and that involved uh, Australian colleague Brian Schmidt, of course who uh, wrote the preface for our first book, which is I did, see behind you is, there. Uh, it's possibly out of screen. Let me just make sure I get this into, uh, there it is, The Fortunate yeah. Universe. Yes. Um, found that the universe, they, they were trying to work out how much matter there was in the universe. 
because the amount of matter controls the expansion of the universe and they expected that the expansion of the universe should be slowing down with time and that should be imprinted on our view of distant supernova. Mm -hmm. What they found is that our view didn't show that the universe was slowing down. They found that the universe was actually accelerating. So the expansion was accelerating. And this was very, very unexpected, right? Um, so you, as I mentioned, matter acts to slow down the expansion of the universe. So you have to ask yourself, what do the universe need to contain such that the expansion of the universe is accelerating? Right. And the answer is that you need a term in the universe which looks like Einstein's cosmological constant. Yeah. Right? So we've gone and relabeled this thing dark energy, mm -hmm. but on the face of it, it has the same kind of properties as Einstein's cosmological constant. Right. So in Einstein's theory of gravity, you tell it what the universe is made of, and it'll tell you how the universe expands. And so uh, you could either say uh, the universe has a cosmological constant and then it'll tell you that the universe, if it's a positive cosmological constant, the universe will accelerate eventually. Or you could tell it, well, there's this other stuff in the universe. It, it's made of some stuff that's not just the matter we see. It's made of this dark energy as well, which has just the right properties that it makes the expansion accelerate the same way a cosmological constant would. That's right. That's right. So the, 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 the issue is, is that when we ask ourselves, what, what's, how much stuff is there out there as dark energy, right? You know, we can talk about the, the cosmic energy budget, right? Mm -hmm. And what we know is that roughly 5% of the universe is in stuff made of atoms. Mm -hmm. So that's us, stars, planets, etc. Around 30% of the universe is us plus dark matter. So dark matter is around 25% of the entire universe, mm -hmm. which leaves around 70% of the universe in the form of this stuff, which is dark energy. Yeah. So it's the dominant energy component to the universe. Yeah. And the problem that we have is that there's nowhere in our physical theories that this stuff naturally sits. It's not inside our standard model of particle physics, right? Mm -hmm. There's no particle associated with dark energy or that we know of. Mm -hmm. It doesn't appear to be hidden away in relativity. And we just don't really know what this stuff could be. Now, people have tried, of course, people have tried to suggest that dark energy might be something to do with quantum mechanics, right? Mm -hmm. That there's this thing called the quantum vacuum. Yes. So this is this notion that, you know, you've got a chunk of empty space. Um, in classical physics, empty space is empty. There's nothing in there, right? No particles, no radiation, nothing. If I take the same block of empty space, but now say, oh, this is now governed by the laws of quantum mechanics. Well, quantum mechanics, there's no true empty, mm -hmm. okay? What you have is that you always have a probability that things will basically pop in and out of existence. So you have this picture that uh, a vacuum, a empty space in quantum mechanics has stuff in it. And that stuff corresponds to like a background energy level. And it turns out the properties of that stuff have the same kind of properties as the cosmological constant term or dark energy. So people were thought, ah, oh, so maybe that's it. Maybe dark energy is the quantum vacuum. Yeah. Except they ran into a problem, right? Right. Is that, you, you, I, I'm going to let you explain the problem. Well, you know this, one too. Well, <laughs> this is a famous one. Uh, so the first thing you do, there's, a, there's a, a wonderful saying from a physicist called John Wheeler who said, uh, never do a calculation until you know the answer, which sounds um, backwards. But what he meant was, don't do some big, long, complicated calculation with all the details in it. Try to make some sort of simplifying approximation, some back of the envelope thing to just get some number out and see if you're in the right ballpark. And so we did that with quantum 
the quantum vacuum. And we, we sort of know how to do that calculation because it actually does make a difference to uh, properties of atoms. So the way the electron moves in an atom, there's something called the Lamb shift, uh, which people can look up. But that we, we know how to do that calculation and get it right and get it tested, you know, observationally, experimentally in the context of an atom. All right, so now let's just do that same thing for empty space, back of the envelope. And the problem is that the number you get out of that is larger than the observed amount of dark energy in the universe by a factor of one with 120 zeros after it, by this enormous amount. Uh, and so that's not a good outcome. I actually went to a talk where somebody said uh, the cosmological constant is nowhere near as bad as people claim. It's not 10 to the power of 120. It's actually only 10 to the 60. Yeah. <laughs> 10 to the 60 is so much better. Uh, it's still a ridiculously large yeah. number, right? The discrepancy is. So we are left with an absolute mystery. Right. The, and that mystery is, is that what is dark energy? And what is it doing in our universe in mm. the first place? If, if, it, if the natural solution is that it's related to the quantum vacuum, then what, why, why is there such a minuscule amount of it in our observed universe? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm not really sure how much further we can push the, the, this discussion, right? Astronomers are trying to come up with new observations to find out if the properties of dark energy have changed over time. So it has a particular property, it's called the equation of state that relates the amount of energy in its sort of rest energy as opposed to the energy it's got in pressure. Yeah. And it, it has a particular value for this minus one. And if it's exactly minus one, and it's always been exactly minus one, it's, it's identical to Einstein's cosmological constant. But if it has varied, if it's not exactly minus one, or if it's varied slightly over its life and it's changed its value, then that means it could be something more interesting, something dynamical, something related to other aspects of physics that we haven't worked out yet. There's a lot of proposed programs that people have got to look at distant supernova, distant gamma ray bursts, et cetera, to try and figure out, can we measure the change in the equation of state of dark energy? The big problem is, is that all observations to date are consistent with it being minus one. Yeah, they're all vanilla flavored. They're all vanilla. And the, te the, the thing is, is that I have, I've been in talks where with well-known, well-respected physicists who've said our conclusion might be at the end of the day that we live in a boring universe where we have a cosmological constant, which is exactly W equals minus one, and we will never, ever understand why. <laughs> right? Yeah. And, you know, that, that because there is, there is nothing to get to grips with in trying to explain this, right? Um, unless something, you know, there's a, a miracle in physics, but I said, I think I've heard a lot of people talk in a very negative fashion about whether or not we will understand what dark energy actually is. But of yes. course, yeah. so for it not to be vanilla flavored, we need it to do something out of the ordinary. Yeah. We want it. We we need it to, as you said, you know, change its properties as as time goes in the universe or something like that. And so we're still trying to push down, down and down, more accurate, more accurate, more accurate. But you know, they were talking about this. You know, this, this has been basically the last twenty years of astronomy, uh, which, which I guess isn't that long a period of time if you look at the history of science. But as it keeps coming back to it's minus one, it, it's minus one. Oh, we looked harder, it's, it's minus one. We kept looking, it's still minus one. Look, there's there's still stuff we can do to get down, but we 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 really would like something, you know, a chocolate chip to turn up or something not vanilla flavored in our ice cream in our universe turn up to give us a clue about what this thing is. Because if it's just straight vanilla flavored, then, you know, it. it there's no sort of, it looks like it's the sort of explanation where we can't find a deeper reason for it. Yeah, yeah. And of course, look, we may never know what the answer is, but we could find out tomorrow. And that's part of the exciting <laughs> thing, right? Somebody could have a theoretical insight. I just go, oh, there you go. 
And there is a there is a slightly crazy idea, of course, which we talked about in our book, Fortunate Universe. If if this if this number had been very large, then everything expands too fast, and you get no structure in the universe. So we've written a paper with our collaborators actually doing some simulations of this. Um, and so some people have suggested maybe this is this is actually this is one of the first sort of successes, and that's a controversial idea of the multiverse idea. Maybe this is just some number that changes throughout the universe. The reason why it's so small around here is because otherwise we wouldn't be here. But that's I, another long story. <laughs> I, I think it's worth mentioning before we wrap up, of course, that one of the people that first put this on the table, the cosmological constant problem, was Steven Weinberg. Yeah. Uh, in several classic papers, he basically asked the question why the cosmological constant is so small. And um, uh, yes, he recently he recently passed away. Uh, but you know, very inspirational papers that made me think about the multiverse.